Please welcome to the stage KKR co-presidents Joseph Bay and Scott Nuttall and Bloomberg executive editor Jason Kelly. Uh, a smattering of applause for you. <laughs> we'll take now it. we got to wow them. Now we got to wow them. Um, well, guys, thank you for joining us to kick off this conference. Thanks to Peter and Eric uh, for teeing it all up. We're going to go down memory lane in a few minutes, but I want to just start in the present with state of deal making. Seller's market or a buyer's market right now? Scott, I'll start with you. I'd say uh, globally on the whole, it's a seller's market. Uh, I'd say, you know, we're late cycle in the U.S. in particular. And if you look at our activity, especially in the private equity side, uh, we've been net sellers, uh, especially in the U.S. and Europe. Mm -hmm. And Joe, you're buying. So where, buying some, where are you yeah. buying? Well, I think as Scott said, in this kind of market where we're late cycle, you've got to be really disciplined on how you deploy capital. I think on average, we're probably more like one and a half to two dollars of exits for every dollar of investment in the past several years. Mm -hmm. So clearly trying to take advantage of this high uh, valuation environment. In terms of where we're buying, I think some of the more compelling opportunities is really where there's complexity. Mm -hmm. That's really where you get the best values, where firms like ours, I think, with uh, the operational capabilities can really bring more value to the table. Mm -hmm. So corporate carve outs has been a big theme for us, whether that's in Japan or Korea or the recent deal we did with Unilever for their spreads business. I think the other area we're spending a lot of time in terms of uh, new investments is really using our existing portfolio companies as platforms for hmm. investment. So internet brands buying WebMD would be a good example of that. And competition for deals, what's the, what's the state there? Who are the competitors and, and how fierce it is, is it out there? Scott? Well, I'd say the competition is significant. Uh, it's both financial buyers and strategic buyers. But to Joe's point, you gotta, you've got to have an angle. You've got to have an advantage. We have used our existing portfolio companies in a number of situations and been able to act like a strategic buyer mm -hmm. by investing more in companies we already <sighs> control so we can extract synergies and act like a strategic buyer. Or to Joe's point, we're really buying complexity and selling simplicity. So some of these large corporate carve-outs are incredibly complex. You've got to really stand up an entire new enterprise to be able to carve out uh, a big segment of a, of a large company that takes a significant amount of resource. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to lean in where you know, others are not. And the public markets today really like the simple stories. And so it's in this complexity that we've been able to find value. Right. So one of the underlying themes or overarching themes i should say of this conference is this year is partnership and we very notably um wanted you guys to to kick it off in part because you're relatively new in your current seats as co-presidents and co-chief operating officers but i want to take you back to 1996 an analyst class i believe of two <clears throat> correct who are both sitting here on this couch um you show up at nine west 57th street expecting what? What do, you, what do you see when you get to, to KKR 22 years ago? Well, it's, it's, Other than you see this guy. Well, I joined first, so oh. I'll, I'll sort of <laughs> See, this is, this is the, he joined six September. weeks, six weeks yeah. eight weeks before me, so okay. he calls himself the more senior of the two of okay. us. This but, is like uh, when twins are born. <laughs> exactly. There's a little bit of that going on. Uh, look, I mean, the, the industry was small. Um, it wasn't even referred to as an industry back then. So KKR, I don't know, we had 40 or 50 employees. Uh, to your point, we were the two analysts hired in New York in 96, and in those days, there'd be years we didn't hire anybody. Yeah. Um, and we were investing, uh, finishing investing our 1993 fund, which was $1.9 billion. Right. So um, we were a you know, small firm focused entirely on private equity just in the U.S. So quite a bit different than where we are today. Today, we're 21 offices around the world, then we were two. And we've grown from 40 or 50 people to 1,200 around the world. So right. significant changes. So why'd you join, Joe? What was the pitch? You know, my story in terms of coming to KKR is probably a little more complicated than Scott's. I was right about to start up at HBS. So I had moved up to uh, Harvard. I was in the dorm. And I got a call from a headhunter two weeks literally before uh, classes started. This was late summer. And a headhunter called me and said, KKR is looking to hire one or two analysts in New York this year you'd be crazy not to go down and meet Henry Kravis. 
which is absolutely right. So I jumped in my car, drove down, spent the entire day in New York, uh, met all the partners in New York, got on a plane and uh, met George and the, my partners in, on the West Coast. And it was really about the people. I mean, they were do, doing obviously very interesting investments, but more than the deals, it was really more the people you met. It's a, a mentorship, an apprenticeship in private equity, and I thought it was the perfect place really to learn how to invest. Do you guys like each other from the beginning, or were you skeptical? <laughs> I remember liking you from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> you spent 20 hours with each other every day. Yeah, we were, you tend to like Our each offices other. were right next to each other. You know, a deal would come in the firm. It was one of the two of us were working on it. Right. So we, uh, no, we've been close friends from the beginning. And so what was involved in being an, an analyst at KKR in, in 1990? Just whatever was coming at you? Yeah, we were both, you know, we were all generalists back in those days. Yeah. There weren't enough of us. I think we had, you know, 15 or so total in, on the investment team. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, what was involved is an opportunity came in, who's less busy right. yeah. would yeah. be the one to t take it on right. yeah. and then take it all the way through, oftentimes through ownership and then ultimately uh, managing it as a portfolio company. Right. And we had less structure then. Like we have very structured investment committees now, portfolio management committees. But back in 1996, it was a small partnership. You know, you were asked to look at a company over the weekend, and Monday you, you walk into Henry Kravis's office and you talk about the company, why you like it, why you don't like it. Uh, but that was really the learning environment back then. Yeah, and the, in those days, the investment committee is you'd walk into Henry's office, call George, and that was your investment committee. It was a little, <laughs> right. bit, yeah, little right. bit different than it is now. But we're, look, we've always been a small family firm. So Henry and George are first cousins. I say that uh, Joe comes from the Korean branch of the Nuttle family. You know, it's like we've all been together for a very long time. Well, let's talk about that because that is something distinct. I, I think it is utterly unique about KKR in the sense that there is literally a blood relation between the two founders sure. who <clears throat> are still there. How do you, you can't replicate that exactly without some very strange science. So how do you replicate the ethos of that between the two of you? Well, I'd say, look, we've been together since we were 24 years old, Joe and I, in terms of working. Um, our families kind of have grown up together. Um, and so we've spent most of our working lives kind of side by side, and um, both inside the office and outside. And it's going to be before too long, we'll have been at the firm half our lives. Um, so Henry and George have been together since they were four. We've been together since we were 24. So you're right, you can't replicate it, but you know, we've been through a, through a lot together. And I'd say with the two of them as well. I mean, the four of us are able to work seamlessly together because we've been together over two decades. Right. I would say you know, personal chemistry, you know, what Henry and George have role modeled for the firm over the last 42 years is really that effective leadership as partners together at the top. And I think Scott and I have very complementary skills, actually, in terms of how we, uh, how we invest, how we manage. But we've learned each other's styles over 22 years working together, and that's really what delivers the efficiency and, and the seamless leadership, I think. All right, so break it down for us. How does it work day to day? You know, there's always a question on Wall Street, it feels like, which sort of falls in and out of love with the idea of co's, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And some people say, it'll never work. And some people say, it always should work. So how does it work between you guys just day to day? How do you split it up? Well, we decided to take a major minor approach. We have a lot of ground to cover. Um, we manage nearly $200 billion for third parties. We've got a, a large balance sheet that we manage for the firm. Um, so it was impossible and didn't make a lot of sense for us both to do everything all the time. So we've taken a major minor approach. There's a number of businesses that I major on and Joe's the minor and vice versa. Uh, so that anybody in the firm, if they can get to one of us, they've in effect been, a been able to get an answer. But that's how we've kind of broken down things. And the majors uh, are things that we've historically both focused on or built, um, and the minor a bit less so. And you know, it all has worked because we both worked across all different parts of the firm over time. So Joe, your majors are? So my majors are our global private equity business, our growth investing platforms, uh, and real assets. So infrastructure, energy, and real estate. Scott. So I've got corporate and real estate credit, uh, our capital markets business, um, our capital raising activities, uh, our balance sheet, and kind of corporate development and strategy. Mm -hmm. And where we overlap is really on the internal functions. So legal compliance reports up to both of us, HR, finance, et cetera. And so how does it work with the founders? What's, what's the day-to-day -day with them? Because those guys are definitely around. Well, the biggest change, I think, since this announcement was made last July they used to have five direct reports. 
with Scott and I being two of those. And today, we, they have two direct reports right. with all the people now reporting up to us. But that's really the change. It, it, it's been evolutionary at our firm. It wasn't a one-time decision, and there was a radical change in our organization. It was really simplifying from five people that reporting to Henry and George to the two of us. Right. Yeah, and to Joe's point, before the announcement last July, he and I together had probably two-thirds of the firm's activities already reporting into the two of us. Mm -hmm. So it's a change, but it's not a radical change. Right. And, you know, look, we were talking amongst the four of us all the time. Email gets used a lot. Uh, and, you know, every Monday afternoon, we've got a standing two-hour call to go through everything going on in the firm. Right. I did. As a preview, I've got an interview coming later this week with George Roberts, who did mention to me uh, as we were taping that uh, with some glee that he likes <laughs> saying to people, um, you know, that's a great question. Why don't you ask Joe and Scott that question? <laughs> so it seems like he, he takes advantage of, of this at that point in Henry too, I would imagine. Yes, it's working quite well. All right. So let's go back to the, to the state of the world if we can. You know, Joe, you talked about some of the areas that, that you're focused on. We talked about private equity valuations a little bit. Some of the areas that you are overseeing mm -hmm. probably could be considered more expansion of, of efforts real assets, where are the opportunities there specifically, maybe in real assets and, and infrastructure, if you will? Sure. I, you know, I think the exciting part of KKR is we've been around for 42 years, but outside of our private equity business, many of our newer platforms have been around for 10 to 12 years, and real assets is clearly falls into that category. You know, infrastructure is one of our um, most exciting areas, I think, for future growth. It's obviously an enormous asset class. It's underinvested globally in infrastructure, and it's where long-term patient uh, capital can really make a difference. So we started that business uh, a little over 10 years ago with a billion dollar fund one. Fund two was $3 billion, and we're well on our way to a six to $7 billion fund three at this point. So we're, we're scaling these businesses uh, to similar size, quite frankly, to some of the funds we have now in private equity. Mm -hmm. Same thing in real estate. We're a little bit earlier there, in terms of the development of that business. We have a US real estate equities business on fund two. Uh, we still have our first fund in Europe we're investing. We'll be starting our business in Asia in the coming 12 months for real estate. And, so still early days. And, and state of real estate at this point, I mean, similar to what you guys were describing in terms of valuations with private equity, where are we in the commercial and residential real estate cycle? Listen, I think you need to be very careful, again, at this point in the cycle. I think a lot of the big real estate deals you're hearing about are not opportunistic real estate. They're more core real estate or core plus. Uh, our focus today in the marketplace on the equity side is really around opportunistic, you know, more private equity style returns, real estate. And these are billion to $2 billion funds, so they're not too big. We have the ability to be very, very uh, opportunistic and disciplined. Uh, you know, and, and real estate's so local, right? So it's hard to generalize by market or asset class but it's really you know, doing the hard work to find that unique value. And just staying with you for a second, infrastructure, I feel like we've been talking about for years, we've been talking about at higher volume for the last couple of years, given what's come from the US government in terms of hopes and dreams about rebuilding US infrastructure. How real is that, pun intended? And are there places where you feel like you're able to invest? It really depends. Uh, our infrastructure product is a global product. Mm -hmm. So we are actually probably more invested in Europe today than we are in the US. Europe is further along that curve around uh, privatization of infrastructure assets, around public partnerships with, uh, with private uh, governments as well, and deregulation, like in the UK. So we've seen more activity coming out of Europe in the past five years in infrastructure than the US. In the US, I think a big focus is really around um, the midstream space. I think with the MLP market uh, still on its back, there's a real gap in the market for capital for uh, midstream assets. And that's really in the last two to three years where we've been leaning in quite aggressively. Mm -hmm. So Scott, you have one of your responsibilities for the past few years has been being involved in the IPO, uh, talking to public investors. The public investor has not, shall we say, <clears throat> embraced private equity as, an, as a publicly traded asset class maybe as much as you would have hoped. Why is that? Well, I think it's a few things. One, it's, uh, it's, it's still relatively young as a space in the public markets. 
And so <clears throat> um, until five, six years ago, there were only a few of us that were publicly traded. So it wasn't really a space. It's now emerging as one. Um, and I think people are still getting up the curve as to what uh, the business is and how it operates. Um, so there's an education aspect to it. I think a second thing that um, is you know, clear is the business models are a bit different. You know, we make money, sure, from the, for the fee aspect, which the market's used to in terms of traditional asset managers. But carried interest is a relatively new concept in the public markets. And I think the markets, to your point, have struggled with how to value it, how to assess it over the long term. You know, what kind of multiple do you put on it? And that's been a big question. And so there's been you know, a pretty low multiple put on, on, on that part of the, the earnings stream. Um, and I think people are waiting, you know, what will happen, you know, when the markets pull back a bit, what, what happens to that carry line over time. But I think, you know, from our standpoint, one of the biggest contributing factors is just the size of the buyer universe. Mm -hmm. So all of us came public as publicly traded partnerships, uh, which means we issue a K-1, you know, as a tax reporting matter. Uh, and that limits the buyer universe. So by our estimates, 60, 70% of the buying universe cannot buy a publicly traded partnership. Right. So we tended to, as a result, focus on a pretty small group of investors with a relatively new story in the public markets. We announced uh, recently that we're actually in the process of converting from a PTP to a C corporation for that reason, to expand the buyer universe. Right. So I think look, it's on us to continue to perform and tell our story. Um, but our hope is that with this conversion, we'll find a, a broader audience. And how big of a deal did, as someone who's been in private equity for a long time, Joe, how big of a deal did that feel like? I mean, to the average person, they're like, uh, okay, like, that the sounds conversion? mildly interesting. But it, is Even it a big the conversion deal? conversion to the C Corp. Yes. No, listen, it's something we've been talking about for a really long time. You know, our goal as a company uh, and for our employees is really to do everything we can to make sure we're as successful 10, 20 years down the road as we possibly can be. And having the right fundamental owners of our business having the right corporate structure so that we could have more flexibility in terms of issuing stock, preferred securities, ways to finance our own business over time. You know, C Corp has a lot of advantages in that way. So I think internally there was a tremendous amount of support to do that. Do you guys expect that the rest of the industry will now follow? I don't know. I think, I think the firms are different. I think we tend to all get painted with a similar brush, but we are quite a bit, bit different. As, uh, By journalists. We're very simple people. We need <laughs> clear all, explanations of things. But we, you know, we as a firm have just a bit of a different business model, again, because we have our balance sheet, right. which is a big part of our um, institution. We have a capital markets business, which is a bit different. Um, so we'll see. I think you know, we'll, uh, we'll see how these stocks perform over the long term. But to Joe's point, this isn't about where we trade in July or through the rest of this year even. Mm -hmm. It's about can we find a set of investors that are more aligned with our thought process around long, really long-term value creation and compounding. So let me ask you about the fundraising on the private side because sure. that, as you mentioned, falls into your um, bucket as, as a major. What's the biggest worry on the minds of your institutional limited partners at this point? Well, look, I think for the most part, the biggest focus is that you know, a lot of them, especially in pension plan world, have a 7 or 8% return target. And if they look across the vast majority of what they've been investing in over the last 5 to 10 years, it has not been generating those kinds of returns. Um, so the real question for them is how do they reach to get incremental return and hit their overall targets? but do so with being cognizant of the fact that we're late cycle, certainly in the US, maybe more mid-cycle in Europe, um, and not take risk at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the discussion is around, well, you know, how do I get that incremental return um, without regret? And that's really been the question. Return without regret. Exactly. The story of private equity. Exactly. Right? <laughs> and so you know, what we're seeing everywhere is you know, a lot of folks are increasing their allocation to alternatives, because that has generated more than the target. Um, and then it's a question of, well, how do you leg into it? And the, the definition of alternatives has continued to expand. Yeah. There's also an element of there's been so much return of capital in our industry, as many people have been leaning into these valuations to exit. So there's this reinvestment concern that many uh, pension funds have and sovereigns have. They're getting more capital back than, than they're deploying in many mm -hmm. cases in the alternative space. I'd, I'd say another big theme and, and focus is they want to do more with fewer firms. Right. I think what we had probably 10, 15 years ago is a diversification. So there was some uh, plans that were invested in 200 different you know, GPs. Mm -hmm. And um, now what they're saying is, OK, I've, I've now bought the index inadvertently. And in, uh, in alternatives and private equity in particular, 
you know, you want to be top quartile. And so now what we're seeing is more of a focus. They're trying to do, you know, more investing with fewer players, which means, you know, broader and larger mandates. And how much leverage does that give them on fee negotiations with you guys? How are you seeing fees trend? Well, we've, you know, we've had a big effort around what we're calling strategic partnerships, where we're very happy if someone's prepared to give us large scale capital, three, five, three, four, five billion dollars over a long period of time with recycling. We're very happy to talk to them about you know, discounted economics, because for us, having that line of sight for 20 to 30 years, which is the duration of some of these long-term partnerships, is significant, and it funds a number of our different right. businesses. So um, I'd say if it's just size, there's a little bit of discussion around economics, but it's really duration, duration. and breadth. Joe, we haven't talked at all yet about Asia. We mm -hmm. mentioned the US. We mentioned Europe a bit. Um, <clears throat> you've spent a lot of time there. That was your previous, your most recent assignment right. before here was, was running that. How had, where does Asia stand in kind of the KKR mindset at this point in terms of opportunity and that sort of buying, selling balance? Sure. I think it's a little more balanced in Asia in terms of buying and selling. It's probably one for one in terms of deployment versus monetization. And it's hard to generalize about Asia given it's a massive geography sure. right, with a lot of different dynamics going on. But if you take a big step back, it is probably the fastest growing part of our private equity business today in terms of AUM, in terms of deal activity, and in terms of our own organizational build. We have eight offices now in Asia, and we're the largest private equity investor in the region today. You know, some of the really compelling trends, I think, you know, people always talk about you know, the really exciting growth in China, India, Indonesia, some of the big domestic emerging economies, which we absolutely are excited about. But some of the less understood opportunities, I think, are really perhaps in North Asia, in Korea and Japan, mm -hmm. probably among the cheapest valuations among mature economies today. Massive conglomerates and family groups that are shedding non-core assets for the first time. And in our business, the ability to really drive fundamental uh, operational improvement, margin improvement in these companies, because they're non-core subsidiaries of large parent companies. So Japan, for us, is one of our top priorities globally in terms of the buyout market, where we're seeing cheaper valuations lower cost funding, financing for deals, a lot less competition than in Western markets, and quite frankly, much more significant operational uh, improvement potential mm -hmm. in the businesses that we're buying. One thing I wanted to make sure we talked about before we run out of time is you've got a couple different avenues that you can pursue within KKR to understand global economics and maybe just as important global politics. So Henry McVeigh, um, giving you sort of the macroeconomic and, right. and in cases microeconomic perspective, as well as David Petraeus, who can give you probably as good a read as anyone on, shall we say, hotspots around the world, right. geopolitics. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing from them as all of us read headlines every day about what's going on in the world and how is it affecting the way you deploy capital? Well, I'll, let me take McVeigh, and you can talk about uh, geopolitics a bit. I'd say, uh, in terms of uh, what Henry McVeigh's group does, it helps us, in the first instance, make sure we're reading the signals that we're getting. So we have a large portfolio around the world. I'd say before Henry and the team got there, we did an OK job using the data. Mm -hmm. But we do a much better job now translating the information we get out of our portfolio companies into kind of forward-looking metrics as to where the world's going. So what's an insight that you've gleaned from him of late? Well, I'd say one of the things that the team has built is kind of these GDP predictor models, um, which have turned out kind of back testing have been quite accurate because we have a lot of uh, good data that we're able to kind of feed into a model that tells us where we think the world's going. And for example, we've been able to back test that and you know, test you know, when we expect a recession to happen in the United States. And that is? Not the next 20, 12 months, but sometime in the next 24, mm -hmm. you know, the readings start to get that you know, we're going to see something. Now, our expectation, it's more of a modest pullback than what we saw last go around, so maybe more like a 2001 type uh, feel to it mm -hmm. as opposed to the financial crisis. But it, it does tell us things like that as to when we expect that maybe we're going to see a bit of a dip in the U.S. economy, and we're able to use that around the world. That would be one right. example. Right. Geopolitics, Jeff. I think with both David Petraeus and Henry McVeigh to a certain degree, it's also around issues like trade, which is obviously in the press every day now. And I think Henry's been, and David, have been incredibly helpful in uh, really guiding our teams at a high level to say, you know, avoid areas where you're dependent on global trade for growth. So, you know, we're leaning into big domestic economies, domestic populations, big domestic consumption stories, 
whether that's Mexico, whether that's Indonesia, China, India, <coughs> versus companies that are highly dependent on uh, global trade mm. for growth. And you know, that's an insight that both have uh, really brought to the table in different ways you know, with our strategic trading partners in Asia, uh, but also in some of the more, I would say, uh, frontier markets for us. You know, David Petraeus in particular, we invested in a cable company in Serbia several years back. We had never invested in Serbia before. And really getting comfortable with the politics, the governance in that country, the political risk in that country was a critical part of getting us comfortable making that first move in that country. So a far cry from 1996 for you boys. Far cry. Right. Yeah. Thanks so much for helping us kick it off. Thanks for Scott having Scott Nuttall, Joe Bay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.